Hello, so there is a new vulnerability in GhostScript that got announced uh, yesterday uh, and there's some other uh, vulnerabilities that are coming out uh, around it as well, some additional things that they found as well as the one that we're going to look at now. Um, first and foremost, I know people from work are watching. Uh, we, we had a meeting, I got distracted by this during during my work day um, and then I was like a couple of minutes late to the meeting and they, they found the YouTube channel, they know about it. I was a few minutes late to the late to the meeting, and I hopped in and says, "Oh, sorry, I was I was distracted by this CVE," and they said, "Oh, cool. When's the video coming out? Coming out today." Um, but yeah, anyway. So hey, use lot. Um, something I want to talk about as well is I had a video up last week about the SSH vulnerability, and there's a couple of things that I want to um talk about with that. So if you hadn't seen that, the SSH vun uh that came out, it's uh the video is on it there. Um, but something that I want to call out since the dust has settled on it a little bit, the, the POC code that came out for that one is uh, old. So the, the test environment that they used for this uh, regression, so it was a, an old vulnerability that came back. Um, the test code that they used was like basically the original test code and used it in theory against these other devices. They were also on a local network, so to keep the lag time uh, in order to... Um, Give themselves the best chance of get beating that race condition so in reality out in the wild chances of that being exploited are slim if it ever does get exploited or if someone finds a reliable way of doing it it is very very damaging because it is a zero to root kind of attack it gives you god rights on the box very quickly um so it is one to keep an eye on but as far as the actual vulnerability goes it is a very difficult one to exploit um and i've still got something running in the background waiting for it it's been running for uh, since I put that video up, so at least a week and still nothing. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a difficult one to exploit. Um, this one on the other hand, I have got working, and I'm gonna show you it in a wee minute. Um, but Ghost Script. Now through this video, I have to apologize. I may say Ghost Writer, another tool that we use, and it, the names are interchangeable in my head. But um, Ghost Script. I never heard of it until this vulnerability popped out but apparently it is very prolific in Linux distributions. As far as I can see, it's mostly GUI-based distributions. So like if you're running Ubuntu as a workstation or Debian as a workstation servers, um, at least a few that I've spun up in AWS just using base installs, it doesn't seem to be there. So um, it could be uh, they're buried in, as some weird dependency for some other application potentially. Um, I know it, it's uh, LibreOffice uses it a lot. It's it's basically a document, um, or from what I understand, it's a a sort of document uh, management tool that other things can then leverage, or a document management framework that other things can leverage to manipulate documents, read PDFs, do things like that. It does also seem to have some printer functionality. Um, if any of this is incorrect or in missing points, please um put it in the comments below. Let me know. Again, I I only learned about this today, so I've been um googling what the hell Ghost Script is. But the vulnerability itself is actually kind of um, straightforward. This is their uh, blog post about it, the technical blog post. I really recommend you read it. It is a detailed read, but it has a ton of good information there of what they did um, and a very nice TLDR at the top. Um, this vulnerability is fixed, I should say. So they, they um, went through responsible disclosure. They told the vendor about it. The vendor released a fix. The fix is then out and now they posted the blog post. So um, if you update your Ghost script to uh, 10.03, um, you're, 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 you're fine. Um, I did also notice whenever I was doing testing that um, Debian, so a base install of Debian, uh, or the current version of Debian, does not have 10.03, uh, it has 10.00. However, Debian have addressed it themselves in the US and um, they call that out further down as well and I, I validated that that yeah it doesn't work on that version that that brand new version of Debian and um, they also have a, a little tool in here that'll show you that checks if your ghost uh, writer ghost script version is is vulnerable and um, so that's really good really detailed POC through here I, I wish all of them were like this this made replicating this so simple um, and easy to do um, from a uh, uh, or what this CV actually allows you to do is uh, run arbitrary code from a doc so i think from an attacker's perspective this could be quite useful for our social engineering of being able to inject a file um, and run code from something they've sent through which is something that can be difficult depending on 
um, the operating system, the age of the um, uh, Adobe or uh, Google Chrome, whatever it is, they're using open PDFs or the documents. Um, a lot of them are quite secure now and they don't really allow for, for com code to be executed. Uh, Ghost Script doesn't. It had a flag that was um, basically a sandbox flag that didn't allow shell commands or codes to be piped out. There was a function in it that allowed piping that was obviously not secure. They patched that with this um, sandbox flag that stopped that from working. And what Codian found was they were able to exploit a buffer overflow attack and change the flag. So they found a way to escape out of the, the memory um, that they were meant to be in, manipulate the uh, memory address which had the flag in it and change it to a zero which then disabled the sandboxing, which then meant they could pipe out super simple um, and execute arbitrary code. The example that they gave um, opened just, you know, a calculator on the on the desktop. Um, I've got that one, I'll show you it, but um, I also made one that does a reverse shell to sort of show that, um, that, you know, you can execute some, uh, some more severe code using this. Um, as I said, I'd recommend the write-up. I'm not going to go through absolutely everything here, but they are super detailed in what their process was of how they identified the issues. Um, they're like sort of chunking up each individual piece and blocking at it until they could get what they needed to do. You can see here that they're just starting to manipulate um, the outputs here based on uh, some of the... the uh, it's not a function call, the parameters. Yeah, the, the device parameters that... Um, go script can use whole thing um really really worth a read um and if nothing else it'll teach you a bit about how buffer overflow attacks work they have um i think this is the exploit code here if i'll play this 11 seconds i think this is the one yeah so they open that it opens LibreOffice, and then pops calculator okay so again if that was something that you sent to a user you know they said oh here's this invoice here's this whatever they open that up and it could pop now again um, this is specific in uh, linux as far as i'm aware there's no uh, vulnerability identified on windows yet so if you're a linux house then it's something to to look at if you're windows you're probably fine um again they've got the mitigations in here basically saying that you know keep up to date to the latest uh, ghost script version and then um also that some os's have independently fixed uh, this vulnerability with a with a patch or an update um, and then they've got this uh, script here that can check if you are uh, if you are vulnerable to it. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to pivot over to my um, virtual machine just to show you what is going on. Here. So this, um, I got it working on the... Um, latest version of Ubuntu. So this is downloaded from the website, uh, Ubuntu, uh, the, yeah, Ubuntu website an hour ago, um, and I could get it working. So if I pull up my terminal um, and I'm going to first do the test kit. If I run the test kit, you can see that they check and this version of GoScript is vulnerable. What, how this code works, I go into the text editor. Um, I, I, I was skeptical at first and I thought it was just going to be checking version numbers and if the version number was this, then it would, um, uh, th then it would say, oh yeah, you're vulnerable or no, you're not. But actually it does do a sort of dummy run of the, um, of the vulnerability. Um, if you read through the documentation, you'll see that it's they start manipulating files and file locations, and that's how they then can do the buffer overflow. And basically, this is where they're manipulating those parameters. They they test if they can manipulate those parameters, and if they can, that's all they need to do to be able to exploit this. So that's what they're trying to do here. So they see it, make sure that they can manipulate those. If they can, it then gives that um, prompt that you've seen that says, hey, you're vulnerable. If that doesn't work, then it says, no, you're you're not um you're not vulnerable so quite a nice sweet test case there there's a lot of poc test cases that just go and just get the version number go yeah you're cool and um, which obviously isn't very helpful uh we then got the uh, calc poc and then the shell poc the shell poc that i've got um is literally just a basic reverse shell i have got elastic stack installed on this 
So what I'm going to do is um, we're going to run this. Uh, I'll show you the calc one first, and then I'll also show you the shell one. And then we'll pivot over to the Elastic Stack interface, and we'll see if anything was detected, anything anomalous was picked up. I'm assuming that the shell should be picked up. Um, I do have a little bit of a, a niggle at the minute where something is blowing away my shell. We get a connection back, but then it stops. Uh, I think it's a firewall issue somewhere in uh, in between here and my neck neck network, but it wasn't relevant for the um just to show the proof of life on this, so um I didn't spend too much time on it. So let me run the calculator one now. I'll show you what that looks like. So run this, and you can see that it's then um opened up the calc, and we'll open up the file here so this is basically a um um in their in their um uh, website they go through quite in detail of how this makes a pdf um and what all this means so effectively this is just a pdf that then has some additional functionality that should not be there and then ultimately if we come down right to the bottom we can see that um the path control active, so this is a sandbox flag that I was saying, is set to zero. Here is where they set it after doing all of the manipulation above. Um, and then they pipe out a, a command. So they pipe out gnome calc and, and then that's it. That's what detonates it. So it's as easy as that. For the POC shell, the only difference being is that I am piping it out to temp cool file. Okay, and the cool file is just a simple C reverse shell. Um, that, that's all it is. So. What we're going to do now is we are going to uh, run that but first let me get my listener set up okay so if i do my uh netcat dash lvp and we'll do 9001 as the port so that's my listener going and here it's just the exact same thing. We're doing the pseudo ghost script. Um, you don't in the code that they showed. You didn't need to necessarily do pseudo, but in this Ubuntu version, I do. I don't know what the difference is there between test environments. Um, no display obviously just um, tells it not to pop up. So I'm gonna then run this. See that everything ran through. It found a controllable stack region that we could do at this index. Um, it then manipulated the memory and changed the control path. And we can see down here we got a connection from uh from the linux server or from the the desktop that is how simple it is as i said it's getting killed it's not getting killed by anything edr related because this was happening before i had any edr or any antivirus on there so um i actually think that's i've, I've got network intrusion and uh, network prevention stuff just in my network i i think that's fiddling with it um potentially not sure um but again not relevant for what we needed to do we got the call back and very little stopped it. So what I'm going to do now, let me pull over Elastic Stack. And let's see if we've seen anything. Okay, so I've let this sit for a minute and we are seeing Jack. Nothing. Now, this is an unexpected and I want to stress Elastic is a, a really, really good um, EDR, SIM, the, the whole thing. I, I really love Elastic. So the fact that this isn't seeing anything, I can see that as a flaw in Elastic. I don't think there's an EDR that would spot this at the minute because this is the thing with new vulnerabilities. There's no detections for them. And that's kind of the point that I want to show here. You know, this won't see anything because it doesn't know what to look for. There's no rules in here that are picking this up. The things that could be detected on here now the yes um the uh, reverse shell as i said was um uh, the connection was closed if that connection stayed open i know elastic and other edrs do pick up on that over time if there's an interactive session going that is something that can um flag and cause an alert because it might look suspicious especially given how it's spawned um i do kind of want to try this against a, a defender for endpoint or or some other EDR solutions as well, because I know some of them have machine learning stuff that makes some assumptions, um, but that's that's a tangent. But the long and short of it is that, you know, for new vulnerabilities like this, your security tools aren't necessarily going to spot them unless you're proactive and go in and create a a new rule to, um, to actually find it. So, you know, go in and actually start building 
query to pick up on this kind of activity. Uh, for me, I think that the main thing that you could uh, potentially look from is that a user calling um, ghost script or um, or LibreOffice uh, potentially spawning lots of weird sub-processes or unusual ones that it's not um, usually used to doing. Not sure if there's an IOC here that I can pick out. I'm going to have a dig through the logs that were captured by Elastic and uh, potentially dig out some IOCs. If I find some of them, I'll put them up on GitHub um, for anyone who can use them. Um, but yeah, the, there's definitely ways to spot this. As I said, I think the main attack path for this would be um, a user... Um, or sorry, an attacker doing a social social engineering and using this as a way to basically pop code on a system. Um, so yeah, I thought this was quite a cool uh, vulnerability. Again, if anyone has any additional information on Ghost Script or the weirdness that it um, might have or other places that it might be used that I could then test. As I said, the only place that I found it to work reliably was on a GUI-based instance of, um, of Linux. Uh, Ubuntu in, in particular, I tried a couple like, you know, uh, Ubuntu server and stuff like that. There didn't seem to be anything natively installed. We would have had to manually install it, and even then, um, didn't seem to um, work great. Uh, so yeah, if there's any anyone knows of other ways that uh, Ghost Script can be called or other um, applications that it's sort of buried in and used off the back, like LibreOffice, let me know. Um, and yeah, apart from that, we'll uh, see you in the next one.